uh, when we broke for the recess, correct? Correct. Uh, Exhibit 91 was what we were talking about. Judge, I think you may have to turn on the thing for me. It's not on. And Exhibit 91, this is what we were talking about, correct? Correct. And you indicated that there was at least two strikes so far, correct? Correct. Um, if we go back to uh, Exhibit number 83, and I'm not talking about strikes, I'm just talking about areas, areas at this time, it would seem that there are three, based on what we see here, there are three separate areas where the source of blood was, correct? Correct. And... Part of the reason would be that the one that's exhibit number 86, this area of the door, plus exhibit number 91, this area here, and then what we looked at here, exhibit number 83, are not joined, if you will, or connected in any way, right? Right. Okay, exhibit number 94. We talked about the wall in exhibit number 91, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And how about down here on the ground? What, are, what kind of drops are those? Those are blood stains that I wouldn't offer an opinion whether those could be passive or be ones that hit the ground from the impact on that west wall, and, on and the but, east wall. And why is that? Because they didn't offer enough characteristics to make a determination. And they could be related to the ones on the wall, they could not, right? Correct. Now, to the right of that, we also see some other staining. Do you see that right there? I do. And is it your opinion that this on the left, is that related or not related to those on the right? May or may not. And why do you say may or may not? There's nothing, there's nothing distinct, a pattern to recognize. They're just blood droplets and single, just a few blood droplets don't always create a pattern. One of the things that uh, we talked about was whether it's a passive uh, placing of the drop versus an active uh, placing. Is this something that gravity acted upon these here or is it something that you can't tell us? I can't tell. The, when I talked about the passive drops, one of the ways that we identify those is because they are nice round 90 degree drops when they impact the surface like this. So they're nice and round. Those aren't as pretty, so to speak. Uh, so I wouldn't want to offer an opinion on that. Exhibit number 95 and what are we looking at here in terms of the scale? We're looking at a scale that is on the south end of the bathroom that has blood stains on top of and underneath the scale. And did you take or did you examine this at the scene or did you conduct your examination back at the lab? I observed it at the scene and then also examined it back in the laboratory. What did you do at the lab? What at the you? laboratory, I did the, the Castlemeyer testing, the preliminary test we discussed earlier on the staining up to the, I think I can touch this up in here. Okay, and you did the Castlemeyer test there? I did the Castlemeyer on that test there. On, on top that, or on that bottom? Steam. On the top. And did you do any Castlemeyer on the bottom? No, I did not. That was actually at the crime scene. Okay, and at the crime scene when you did the Castlemeyer, what part of it, the bottom of the scale, did you examine? Or did you not do the Castlemeyer at the I did not do any Castlemeyer on, right. on the bottom surface. But there was a reddish substance that you believe to be blood underneath there, right? This right here. Trying the technology. That one right there. And knowing what you know about blood spatter, what is the scenario? How is it that this blood drop 
<clears throat> was stuck, if you will, is it to the scale or is it to the, the floor? It is on the floor. The stain is on the floor itself. Okay, so if the scale is on top of it, what does it tell you about the stain that's there? That the scale was moved into the position above the blood stain. And do we have any issues about water with regard to this one or not? No. Exhibit number 96. Okay, right up against the wall here, do we see? There are blood droplets. And did you have occasion to look inside the uh, wastebasket? I did. And what did you find in the wastebasket? There was a paper towel and two empty toilet paper tubes type cardboard rings. Did they have anything or any indication of blood or anything that looked like blood in that tub, in that uh, wastebasket? Uh, I examined those, the toilet paper tubes back in the laboratory and my indications with my test were that there was blood detected. So you now have what appears to be blood, in your belief it is blood, in the, in the trash can there, you have it right again, there, and then you also have it underneath the scale. How many events are we talking about here at this point? Well, we've discussed that there, you, you counted three prior. Right. And then that this, is, can, this is more bleeding, but I don't know how many events that are moving into the corner. Would this be a separate event from the other involving the wall? This one over here. The direction, it seems far to have it traveled, but I, wouldn't, I don't know that I could rule it out completely. It's, it's possible that it could be another event that was occurring in this area here. Yes. Just to orient ourselves, exhibit number 93. This is the scale we've been talking about, and the trash can is right here, correct? That's correct. And then we have the sink area, right? Yes. Exhibit number 98. What are we looking at here? We're looking at the sink that is to the north. Uh, in the, there's two sinks in the bathroom. This is the one to the north. And we've been talking about events so far. We've talked about three. Or is this a separate event? Uh, From the other, yes. Um, let's start talking about this area here in front. Um, it's first of all, would you agree or disagree that the coloration of that seems to be a little bit different than the one inside the bowl? I would. And what would cause something like that? It, it appears diluted as if it would be with water. And exhibit number 100, <coughs> as it applies to that, what are we looking at here? It, the blood is dripping down the side of the... The, the ledge of the counter. So in terms of what we've been talking about, passive versus active, what or how would you characterize this? How would you define it? Tell me about it. Those diluted patterns, I would say, are uh, evidence of transfer between a blood-bearing source and a non-blood-bearing source. Um, but as I indicated earlier, I don't, I don't know if this is blood is present already and then something moves through it or the blood is on another item and then transfers onto the counter but or a combination thereof. But it could, all, but bottom line is there is at least at some point the source placing the blood there. Right? Absolutely. And at some point something came by and swiped it if you will. That's, Correct. I think you call these swipes, right? Swipes or wipes, yes, depending. If we look to the left of that, do you see this right here? I do. Is that the same thing as what we were look, we've been looking at or not? Those are what we were previously discussing as passive drops that are simply acting upon, being acted upon by gravity. Let's look at uh, exhibit 105. Are those the ones we're talking about? Yes. And then a larger view of it, or 102, you see that? Yes. All right, well, how could these blood drops here uh, on exhibit 105, how could they find their way to get there in that shape? The blood source was above this location, above the sink. And was the, the sink. blood source 
what was the blood source doing? Bleeding. To, I understand that, <laughs> but was the blood source, mo source moving left to right, moving front to back, or just stationary? Well, it, depending which way, if that's it, moving into the sink or backing up out of the sink. All right. But in some sort of motion over the sink. At some point, there was some motion by the blood source over the sinks, and that's what that tells you, right? Correct. And it also tells you that, I guess it was over the top of the sink. Over the top. Is this a function of, partly a function of gravity? Yes. We've talked about those, and you indicated a sort of in and out motion by the source. And then we talked about this source, or not this source, but this area here on the ledge. Both of those appear, from what you're telling me, to be somewhat movement oriented, or, or would that be incorrect? No, I'd say that. I would agree with that. How about this area here, inside the bowl? And in terms of placement of the source, 103, Three shows it, and then also 104. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Can't yes, take I it. see that. I'm sorry. Um, in terms of where the source was, and based on the patterns that you have there, the source is above the sink, and some of those you can you can see are specific droplets. Some of them, because of the curvature of the sink, are merging together. But the source of the blood is? Above the sink. Do these also imply movement, like those that are down here, or do they not? Well, they're, since they move in, they're in several different locations, it would imply that the, the blood source is moving a bit, yes. Could all of these functions, exhibit 104, the scraping there, or the swiping, the dropping of the blood there. Let me see if I can focus a little bit more. And the, um, in the middle of the tub of the sink, do you, does that give you any indication of time or can these all be done at the same time? Or are they events that are occurring? There's one, there's another, we just don't know which is first. Why just, don't you tell me about that? I would say that this could be this movement at the edge of the sink could be concurrent with the drops that are into the sink. Including the ones that are in the middle there. Yes. Exhibit number 98. See this area right over here near the mirror? I do. Was there any blood spatter or any blood on the mirror? There was. It's very difficult to see when we get to those shots because of the mirror, but there was. There was some on the mirror? With regard to the um, blood on the mirror or the substance on the mirror, what kind of action or um, what can you tell me about those patterns? Uh, when I was talking earlier about the, the categories, I discussed the projected blood, that blood that is um, that a force or a pressure acts upon to eject a volume of blood. This would be categorized in that category and could be a number of different mechanisms. Sure, but let's just talk about, is this what we're, Exhibit 100 is, where was the blood? I, I understand that perhaps because of the flash we're not really able to see it, but if you could tell us where it would be or show us on the monitor there. If I can get my finger to do the right working here. There were stains probably. If I have that about right. There, there would be, it wasn't as concentrated as this, but there, uh, in, the, in the, when you can see the photos, you can see similar to this up here. And this right here, this event underneath it right there, is that the same kind of spatter? Yes. It, do you know whether or not this spatter here was caused by the same event that caused the spatter? It would be consistent with being from the same event. Could it also be a, a second event? Potentially. And Exhibit 103, if you could clear it. Exhibit 
this is what we're looking at here, right? Yes. Well, what about these heavier ones, heavier drops in there? What is that about? Uh, there could be, this large one could be part of this path, the passive drops that are down in the bottom of the sink. They can also just be larger blood stains that just drips together. And if we take a look at exhibit number 101, are we then looking at this spatter? And again, my question is, how come some are dripping and some aren't? Because during when blood is acted upon with force, that not all uh, the blood droplets don't all break into the same size, and so some are going to be larger. And so some, when they hit that, have more of a weight or a volume, and therefore they drip down from the gravity because they're a larger stain. What um, can cause this kind of spatter pattern? A mechanism that might sure. have done that. Mm -hmm. um, I earlier discussed the, the expirated, which was somebody maybe coughing or sneezing if they have uh, blood in their in their airways or from a wound, air forcing that out. Um, the head is a very vascular area, and if I don't know if you've ever nicked yourself shaving, then you know that those can bleed quite a bit. And a wound or a laceration to the head could cause the misting and the, the patterns that we see here, the size staining that we see here. And what else? Anything else? Um, gunshot wounds can produce that, that type of misting effect as well. Do you, when you are examining these kinds of things, do you just look at it in the pattern without reference to anything else that's at the scene, or do you also look at what may be around these patterns to provide guidance to you as to what, in your opinion, could be causing these patterns? When we are at the scene, we are making observations of what those patterns are. What do they look like? What are their sizes? What are their sizes? And then we formulate other, we use other information such as um, investigators' information, the medical examiner's information to make determinations on what potential mechanisms created those stains. Do you also look at the area around it? To, yes. To potentially to see if there's anything else there. So for example, in this case, uh, exhibit number 114 shows us what? What are we looking at there? There is a casing laying in a, in a blood stain. Well, tell me a little bit about this casing and how it was placed there based on your uh, knowledge of blood spatter uh, evidence, not evidence, but blood spatter um, uh, um, training. The blood stain was there and the casing came and landed upon that. If the casing falls into the blood, what does it tell you about the blood source in terms of sequence as to whether or not the blood source was already bleeding before the gunshot wound. It would tell us the blood was, it was already present, so the blood source was already bleeding prior to the gunshot. So, I don't know about this weak person, but what does it tell you in terms of this? Was the blood source already bleeding at the time that this casing somehow found its way into that blood? Yes. Approach. With regard to that casing, in terms of when it was placed, was it placed uh, in relation to the blood? When was that casing placed there in relation to the blood? After the blood was deposited there. So the blood source was already bleeding? Yes. So based on that, and based on, you indicated that you read the medical examiner's report? Yes, right? I did. And having read the medical examiner's report, having taken a look at that, what is your opinion then as to the source in exhibit number 101, or the mechanism as to how that pattern there was formed. Then I would say that it would be either the expirated, the coughing, or the laceration to the head, one of those mechanisms. But not the gunshot? Not the gunshot. Take a look at um, exhibit number 116. Are you familiar with that area? Yes, this is the linen closet to the north of the sink area. And exhibit 117, what are we looking at there? It's an accumulation of blood at the edge of the linen closet. We, we keep talking about accumulation of blood. As it applies to this particular accumulation, is that an accumulation that took some time or is that something that's immediate? 
how, how that is would, it dep I don't know how much blood is there. It looks like a large amount. It would be a, a, pro a product of time of the blood source being in one position for a little while, but I don't know how long. And how was it formed? Do you know whether or not it's a product of gravity or perhaps the source laying down? I do not know. It could be any of those, it right? It could be those. The fact that there is blood, for example, in different areas, does that tell you anything about what the blood source may have been doing? Moving. Do you have any idea, because of the blood being different places, do you have any idea how fast or how slow the blood source may have been moving, or is that not something you just can't talk about? Something I just couldn't say. We then take a look at Exhibit 115. In terms of the uh, item that we just looked at, what are we seeing here? There's, I'm looking for a better glyph. Well, then let's take a look at 118. Is this a better one? It is. There's a, there's a box within that linen closet that has, that shows, as you can see these big demarcations, that water didn't make the point. Why don't you clear that up a little bit <laughs> and start all over? I think you ran your finger. Finger too much. The markings, there you go, right in that area, show that water has wicked, bloody water has wicked up into the box. Um, and in this case, how is that, how can that be accomplished? How can we get this pattern that's on the box accomplished? How there does would, that happen? There would be water coming into the water, these other stains, this stain here, has the diluted appearance on the edge. So it's a lighter shade of red. And you can see the diluted shades of, uh, I don't know if I'm marking everywhere, uh, the diluted shades of, of blood. And that simply travels up the box in a wicking motion, in a wicking action. The fact that it looks like it's all the way around the box, does that speak to the volume of blood that was around this area? Or is it, you can have this little bit of blood and then it sort of mushrooms out if you apply water to it. I couldn't quite comment on the volume of blood other than you can still see it's very, the demarcation lines are very red, so it seems like a, a, it's not just a drop of blood in water. Okay. We've seen this item there. Now if we look a little further on down, Exhibit 125, we see another one of those. Do you see that? Yes. What can you tell us about the fact that there's these very much larger um, circular areas of blood? What, can, what does that say about the source? Or can you tell us anything about what the source was doing? Well, the source, had, like I addressed earlier, that it could either be the action of the blood source being in one position there for a while, bleeding, bleeding the, the, that accumulation, that little pool. Or there could be some process of this, this with the water contact, it pooling in one area, but I, I'm not certain about that. Okay. Exhibit 120. Are you familiar with item number six on this photograph? No. Are you familiar with having done screening on a hair follicle? Uh, at the, I did screening on the hair. I was not, Why don't not you take certain the, that it was um, number six. Do you know whether or not it was the hair was at the number six location or not? I would only be able to know a property ID number referencing my report, but I don't Why know Why don't you go ahead and do time. that, all right? Okay. Did you just do that with your report? Sure. Exhibit? Yes. found what you 
we're looking for, let me know, but don't read it out loud. I found the property ID number for the, the one. All right, one. go ahead and put the report back and tell me, did you do any work with regard to this number six? I know the property ID number. Oh, I see. You can need the property ID number? I know that that, can I, ref, can I look into my notes as well? Sure, please. Let go me ahead. see if that helps. If that was number 6LB, that's what I had it referenced as, 6LB. All right, and is that, what is 6LB? Was a possible hair. And what did you do with that possible hair back at the lab? Back at the lab, I did my preliminary Castlemeyer test. Uh, did it get indications of blood? But on the end, that appeared to possibly have a root fall. I, or had white material consistent with being a root. Um, I processed that and sent it forward for DNA analysis. Why did you focus on the root as opposed to the hair itself? Because that's where we can get our DNA. That's where, Is that where our the DNA, DNA resides. Processes. Yes, for the way that we process DNA. Yes. Let's take a look at uh, Exhibit One Twenty Six, and for reference, you see this door trim there. You see that? Is that the closet? Well, why don't you take a look at it and. Uh, Take a look at it. If that is the, the linen closet, that's what I'm just trying to orient myself. All right. So where would this be then? If, this the, were... if that is the edge of the linen closet, then this is the west wall of the master bathroom hallway. My question is, why is this area here much lighter than the other um, stains that we've been looking at due to the contact with water that that water has has spread over this area and has not affected the other areas as much see this area right here yes what is that that would be a uh, transfer stain as we talked about earlier the a blood bearing source coming into contact with another source with another surface and so sort of a sliding kind of process there? It is linear, so it could be sliding that, that way, correct. Then exhibit number 127. Do you see that there? Yes. And what is this, what's going on here? It appears to be the same. It's a, a transfer, again, a transfer pattern. But why is it up here that it's just linear and down here we have it coming down do you see that there's more volume for, for one reason for whatever reason the contact with the blood source was more there's more of a volume that caused it to to drip down exhibit number 129 see the door up here yes and so which wall is this one right here that is the west wall as we look at this, part of the reason I want to talk about this is, what is this over here first? That is the saturation stain on the carpet. So that is carpet then, right? Yes, that's carpet. We see this right here. We see, you see that little circle there, kind of half circle thing there? You see that? I see the curve. Mm -hmm. And then this area here is relatively clean. And then you follow this around. And all the way back, it also appears to be relatively clean until you see this spot here and this other spot here that we've talked about previously. How is it, or what does that tell you in terms of the depositing of blood when you have a situation like this, and then you take a look at the left right there? Well, where we can see that water has come into contact, it could be that water has gone through the entire middle. But if water's gone through the middle, what's going on over here, and it seems to be in a round circle down here. Can you tell me how that happens? Maybe there was something there that prevented it from from for them being from that sort from that area being bloody. Would it also be consistent with for example a cleaning utensil of some sort? It could be yes. Coming through here and doing this? Sure. In looking at these along the wall here is it a circumstance that the source is bleeding as it goes along there or are those any of those related to strikes or is it just a situation that the source 
as it passes through there. However it passes through there, it's just depositing the blood. Is that how what's going it on? It could or? be. They're not really uh, in a pattern for me to determine this was where an impact occurred, this is where something else occurred. They're just a bunch of uh, blood stains and some accumulations and the dilute factor. So I couldn't really talk about a specific incident each down the down that hall. But could you tell me whether or not the source at least was in these areas to yes. deposit that blood? Yes. And at the same time, was the source at least depositing blood on the left side of it? Yes. Now let's take a look at Exhibit 132. Is this the carpet? Yes, it is. If that's the carpet, what's the what wall is this? That's one? the east wall. And again, we see this up here. Do you see right above the switch there? Or yes. Not switch, but the electrical outlet. And then this right here. Right. What could create that sort of circular half moon kind of pattern on the wall? Any sort of the transfer, it's a transfer type stain, so anything that would be blood bearing coming into contact with it, or the blood being on the wall and something coming into contact with it and moving it along. And then, if we take a look at the area to the right of the switch in Exhibit 133, we see that circular pattern also, right? Correct. And so, and why is that? coming down right to the right of that switch. What does that say? It might just be an act, a, a matter of the volume that contacted it right there. This area here of the blood pattern going through there, that speak, does that speak to the height of the action of whether the, the source had blood or whether there was blood there? Is that what it speaks to, the height? The height that the, the transfer occurred at, yes. would be. And then underneath it is what we have here. Right. Would it be consistent with the source being this high and then bleeding down, and, and these be a result of those gravity? Could, those could be from, from gravity. It's, it, because of the water, it makes them very difficult to determine them from a specific event, but they were clearly deposited there. What, why does the water make it difficult to do that? Because it washes away the edges of any of the blood stains and makes them not regularly shaped, which is what we look for in, in, in identifying patterns. Down here, you see this area here? Yes. Now, that area was cut out and we've taken a look at it. Have you actually taken a look at the rug yourself? The I, I did see it when somebody else had it out, yes. And so you did see it? I did see it. And with regard to this particular stain, this is exhibit number 131, what can you tell us about it? But that is a, a large a saturation stain, which means that it's, it's a large pool, an accumulation of blood or a blood pool that's gone into an absorbent material, i.e. the carpet. So can you tell us anything about whether or not the source was um, standing, kneeling, or whether or not the... I couldn't define the position other than it was over that area. What about right here? Do you see this one sort of seems for lack of a better term, more pristine, whereas this one up here seems to be rubbed. Do you see that? Yes. Well, what could cause that? It could be any sort of uh, contact with that stain. Somebody walking through it could do that? Absolutely. Um, were you able to determine whether or not there had been any water applied to this area? Not when we saw this side, but when we saw the underside, we did. Okay, I'm asking about what you saw. Okay, so okay. when you saw, the, did, you, did you see the underside? I did see the underside. Okay. Um, on the underside, were you able, how is it that you were able to see whether or not water had been applied? How are you sure that you did see that? Because there, there was the same way that looking down the hall, there was the dilute blood stains. The, you could see the light shade of red covering areas of the tile. It was very much diffused um, around this, under this carpet, under this stain, uh, kind of the same coloration maybe as that, the, the box that was in the linen closet. So a lighter shade, shade of red, implying it had been diluted and it had, had flowed down in that area. And you were talking about to take a look at Exhibit 115. You're talking about this box down here at the yes. bottom. So the water that had been applied, were you able to tell if the water had come through the top or if it had just been in this direction? In other words, was the top wet or was it just the bottom or? Speak to me about the moisture on that. 
Well, when we, had, when we were at the scene, I don't recall it being wet, but looking at it from underneath, it had at least seeped through from the edge of the tile on, but I don't know how it, okay. the mechanism for carpet. Well, let me take, show you exhibit number 128. We see that same stain there on yes. the left side. And then we look over here on the right. Do you see that on the right? Yes. What is going on with that? It, it appears to be a lot of transfers, and part of that could be from either stains that have been disrupted by walking over them. It could be a product of the the diffused, uh, the, the, the diluted blood flowing under, and then it being walked on and in, in coming up to the surface. So I, it I could can't make a this. I can't make a an absolute it, determination. It could that. be. I think you used the word. Tra did you use trampling? Trampling. I said or transfer, but are this like the stepping could be. Uh, if there had been pr nice looking stains there, walking over it could have disrupted that and created this. Does it, this imply a lot of walking or a little bit of walking? Well, there's a, there, it's not a pristine looking area, so it would imply a lot of movement of some sort. Could or it also contact be, of some sort. Could it also be that, do you see that it sort of seems to end here? Yes. Did you see any that went this way, this walking motion, that, or if it was walking this way? I mean, beyond this, yes, beyond this, this I never saw any blood beyond this area in the bedroom. So this is the only area that you saw this staining of blood, right? Correct. Did you see any blood throughout the master bedroom anywhere other than right here in this area? Just right here, and then I think right, there was maybe one stain or so right outside the closet here. Where? Right here. Sh show me where. Right here. I just wrote on top of it. Okay, so was it a large stain or a No, small? just a couple drops maybe. A couple drops there? And, but did you see any near the bed, anywhere else? No. no, I did not. How about near the area where the bathroom goes into the closet? Did you see any blood staining there at all? In the closet, no. On the carpet at all? No. So with regard to this staining here, would it be consistent with, and if you know, you don't know, somebody sort of walking on this for whatever reason they're walking on this particular area and not going into the bedroom. Yes. But perhaps going this the other way. Perhaps, yes. Let's see, uh, look at exhibit number 78. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And was there any staining here? Was there any blood? staining at all. That's the closet, right? That's the closet, no. And then we have some, something right here in the corner there. Do you see that? Yes. If you then go to exhibit number 121, that's the area, right? Correct. Well, describe for me what's going on. What's the action? Another transfer pattern, the contact between a, a blood bearing source and another surface in a and linear fashion. As they're going by. Yes. Right? Did that extend in this direction in any way at all? No. So that we know where we're headed, exhibit 78. You see the number two there? Yes. Exhibit number 79 shows us that corner there, right? Yes. And right there is what at that turn? That transfer again. And exhibit 81 shows us, first of all, what is this part right here? Uh, it appears it could be a, a transfer. Uh, no, again. I mean, what does it lead to? This it leads to, oh, it's the lip of the, of the shower. And is that where the body was? Yes, it was. And so we then see this right here, this reddish substance. Again, what does that mean in terms of arriving there at that place. That something, a bloodstained source came into contact with it. And is it the transfer uh, pattern that you talked about? It's consistent about? with the transfer, yes. And uh, is this a swipe or not? I mean, we've used that term also. Uh, I don't, I would not be able to make a determination if the blood was there first and got wiped through or if the, the thing that made the contact with the shower was, was blood. All right. Coated item. If we then go back to exhibit 121, let 
going to focus in on this area here. Do you see that right there? I do. What is that? It's called a pattern transfer where you can actually identify a pattern within a transfer stain. And the pattern that you have there, is that consistent with a barefoot? Is that consistent with socks? Or is that consistent with shoes? It's consistent with a shoe, Trey. So it's not consistent with a barefoot? Correct. And it's not consistent with a, with a sock? Correct. So if we look at Exhibit 122, that's what we're looking at, right? Yes. And what's the direction of this particular um, stain? If it again, is. Let me give you Exhibit 249. And I'll bring it in closer. It was right in this area, correct? I think I just saw, can you lower it down a little bit? I think I saw where it says shoe tread right on the, the lip there. Shoe impression. Something okay. Like they're drawing. What was the direction of that print? This is, it was... All right. And that's the direction of this footprint that we have here. If you could yes. clear it out for me. Yes, sorry. Exhibit 162. See this right here? Yes, I do. Is that a shoe or is that a sock? It appears to be a sock. Would this sock make an Exhibit 122 this pattern? No, it would not. Go back to this photograph, Exhibit number 162. See that down there? What is that? A foot. Is a that foot, foot. Does that foot have a sock on there? It doesn't appear to. Does it have a shoe on there? No, it does not. Could that foot have made that pattern that we see there? No, it could not. What does it mean when this pattern is in what, blood, right? Correct. What does it mean in terms of the individual who wore this shoe, in terms of the sequencing and how this blood could have arrived there? That they were walking through the bathroom after blood was shed. And after they were wearing shoes? And after they were, yes, correct. I don't have any other questions. Cross-examination. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to begin, before we get into some of the other things you talked about, um, talked about being at the crime scene, correct? Correct. Okay. And a few moments ago, I think recently enough, I want to show you the picture again. Uh, the state showed you a bit of blood that was on the lip of the shower. Correct. Or the, the base of the shower, right? Yes. Okay. In the shower stall, the walls, everything that encased it, was there any blood found there? On the floor only. Okay, on the floor only, not on the walls? No. Okay, and no traces of blood on any of the walls, correct? No. Testing, okay. Now I just wanna go back to uh, exhibit 249. I believe this will demonstrate things a little better than the photos. Uh, a few moments ago, uh, Mr. Martinez showed you the, uh, the the pool of blood that is denoted in the, that was in the carpet that's denoted by this area. Do you recall seeing that? I did. Okay. And he asked you some questions about um, if there was any blood any farther inside the room than than that point where the where the the blood ended in the pool, correct. correct? Okay. And you mentioned a few drops that were over towards the closet, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, but you said there was no blood in the closet. No blood in the closet. Okay. And it seemed to me what the implication here was in terms of, of what you were saying is that someone could not have walked through the blood-covered carpet into the closet without bringing some trace of blood 
with him. Is that accurate? It seems that it seems like a logical explanation. Okay. Yes. So, and ultimately, what we're really saying, whether it's into the closet or not, uh, no one would have walked through that pool of blood once it was deposited. Is that accurate? Nobody would have walked through. Walked through it because we would have seen signs of transfer, at least towards the room, I should say. But towards the bedroom, I didn't see. I didn't observe. Didn't see anything beyond that one little area. Whether somebody would walk through, I don't know. Right, and and, and if and if I was unclear, okay, I, I, I apologize. But no, you wouldn't see. There's no evidence of somebody having walked through after that blood was deposited. There. Correct. Is that correct. That's all I have. Thank you. Any redirect. With regard to somebody either walking through the, that area into the bedroom, where have we looked at that has all of the blood in it? All, all the blood is in the, well, the blood is in the master bathroom and that area of the carpet. And in the master bathroom, is there something called water? Yes. Was water used in this case uh, as part of an attempt by whoever it was to sort of change the patterns there? Objection. Overall. Can you, no, after that pause, can you restate the question? Sorry. Was, could you read it back to her? Was water used in this case as part of an attempt by whoever it was to, to sort of change the matter? I would say water did change the matter as to the motivation, I wouldn't want to speculate on that, but water did alter what I saw. And that water that was used in there, could that water also be used, for example, to wash, I, I don't know, hands? Could they also be done to you to do that? Yes. Could it also um, be done to, for example, clean feet? Could it be done to do that? Yes. And water, um, do you know what a towel is? Yes. Could a towel then, after water was used, could that be used to wipe up feet yeah, and hands and that sort of thing? Way beyond the scope of cross. Sustained. You were asked whether or not you saw anything or any other um, blood, if you will, exhibit 249, in this area here, right? Correct. With regard to the properties of blood, is it difficult for water to clean them off the body, for example, the hands? To wash blood off the hands? Right. No. I don't have any other questions. Looks like we have a few questions from the jury. Are there any other questions? Council, please approach. All right, the jurors have some questions for you. Is it possible for the shower to have been completely cleaned of blood on the walls and door with water? It would wash away the appearance of it. Uh, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be able to see anything if you washed that, put enough water on it. Would there have been some trace even if washed? If we had done testing, we might have been able to prove that, yes. Is there a way to measure the volume of blood in the rooms? And if so, where most, where most of the blood was located? As far as uh, measuring a quantity of blood, it's really, I would say, more of a medical professional's opinion to be able to offer that. Um, I could just say that it was an accumulation and there seemed to be a quite a, a, you know, a substantial amount of it, but I couldn't offer an opinion of how many milliliters it was. Any other questions from the jury? Follow up from the state? No, thank you. Mr. Nermi. Did I hear you correctly? You didn't test anything else in the shower? In, in the, the shower, shower, I did not do any testing in the shower. We, you mean Mesa Police Department? Well, that I personally didn't conduct any testing. I don't know about other units. Okay, thank you. You may step down. The state may call its next witness. It calls uh, Detective Flores. Detective Flores, do you understand? Yes, I do. Your name, sir? Detective Esteban Flores. And yesterday we were talking about the statement that uh, you had with the, or the telephonic conversation that you had with the defendant on June 25th of uh, 2008, correct? Yes. And during that time that you and she discussed uh, her knowledge of the PIN numbers used by Mr. Alexander? Yes. And uh, the exhibit 285, number 23, includes that portion of the conversation. 
conversation. Yes. Move for the admission of Exhibit 295. Can we approach? You may. 295 is admitted. one PIN number that he always used, um, and that was 1220. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was his voicemail PIN number, too. Oh, and he had a garage PIN that I have, too, which is different. His garage was, his 1220 was his PIN for his ATM, because there are many times when he needed his car to go get money. Um, Do you think he and that was just his phone as well? It's possible. I don't know what kind of, I mean, mine's not password protected. Oh, mine is password protected. Mine, before it wasn't. So I, um, so the one for his, um, his ATM was Joseph Smith's birthday, so that's how I always remember that. And then he gave me the garage PIN number, which was um, 0187. And I think that was Chris Hughes' birthday. Oh. Okay. Sir, as part of this investigation, were the police able to learn whether or not there were any roommates that uh, Mr. Alexander had? Yes, he had two roommates at the time. And with regard to those two roommates, what are their names? Uh, I cannot remember their names off the top of my head right now. Is, do you know Zachary Billings? Do you know yes, Billings? Zachary Billings. And Enrique was the other one? Right? Yes. With regard to those two individuals, did the police investigate their whereabouts at the time that this crime occurred? Yes, we did. And were you able to establish where they were at the time that this crime occurred? Yes. And were they associated in any way with this crime pursuant to your investigation? They were not. Sir, did you have occasion to view the Inside Edition interview that the defendant gave in September of 2008? Uh, were you able to view that? Yes, I was. With regard to that, were you able to listen as she discussed the issue of whether or not she had killed Mr. Alexander? Yes and also whether or not any jury would convict her? Yes. Are these those two excerpts, exhibits number 247 and 248? Yes, they were. I move for the admission of exhibits 247 and 248. Are we approach? You may. Exhibits 247 and 248 are admitted. I understand that everything all of the evidence against me right now is very compelling. What really happened in there? In a nutshell, two people took Travis's life, two monsters. You did not shoot Travis? No, I've never even shot a real gun. You did not stab him 27 I've times? Never, ne that's, that's heinous. Or I've never. slit his throat from ear to ear? I can't imagine slitting anyone's throat. Let's take a look at uh, exhibit number 248. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. I don't have any other questions at this time. Cross-examination. Hello. Days back, I guess it was yesterday, you, we heard some excerpts of a call you had with Miss Arias, I believe, on the 25th of June. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I think we heard you say that that entire conversation was about an hour and 45 minutes, that the one we heard excerpts from? Yeah, it was over an hour. Okay, and um, during that phone conversation, 
Um, you talked to her about how prior to her move, remember there was discussion about her move in April of 2008? Yes. Correct, okay. And uh, during that discussion, you talked about uh, how she, or she, excuse me, talked about how she lived with Mr. Alexander for four or five days. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Um, was that anything you discussed with uh, Mr. Alexander's roommates? Do you have any knowledge if they knew about that or not? No, I did not ask them about that. Okay. And during that same line of questioning, I guess, when she talked about moving back home to Wairika, there was some discussion about uh, phone calls or phone contacts she had with Mr. Alexander uh, subsequent to moving back to Wairika. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. And um, do the phone records bear that out? The phone records you obtained bear that out, that the two were conversing after she returned in April? I would have to look at the phone records to, to be absolutely positive. Okay. I know they had constant contact back and forth with each other. Okay. And there wasn't, there wasn't a point in time where that ceased for a long period of time, it would seem, right? No. Okay. So I guess we could assume then that that probably took place in, in April, May of 2008, right? That could, phone contact. Could have. Okay. Now, there was also another case, uh, mention uh, around the same time period. Ms. Arias mentioned that um, she trashed his car. Yes. Do you recall that? And I just wanted to put it in context because of the excerpts. We were talking about uh, an incident where a U-Haul dolly was involved and, and the engine exploded. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? Yes, it was a, an accident. Basically. Okay. Just a minute. talk to you about well let's let's back way up a bit here because I think you probably told us this the first time you took the stand but um, could you remind us again how long you've worked for the Mesa Police Department 19 years okay and how long you've been a detective uh, for about uh, since 2002 okay so I'm guessing when, way back when, 19 years ago, when you started as a patrol officer, I would assume? Yes. Okay. Um, that you went through the academy, right? Yes, I did. Okay. And while you were at the academy, you probably learned the importance of report writing. Yes. Correct? And, and when I say report, we're talking about departmental reports. Sometimes we call them DRs. Yes. Is that right? Okay. And one of the things you probably learned is it's important to be honest and accurate as possible in those police reports uh, because they could be used later on in proceedings such as these, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I suspect, uh, and, and detectives of promotion, correct? Uh, not really in my department. It's more just like a lateral okay. move. It's a specialty. It's okay, it's a specialty. But over the course of your career, I suspect you attempted to endeavor in becoming a detective, you expected to endeavor to make the most accurate and honest police report you could. Is that, is that yes. fair to say? Okay. Yes. Have you reviewed your police report recently, detective? Uh, within the last few weeks, yes. Okay. Well, let me maybe get a copy of it for you. Your Honor, if I may approach. Yes. Detective, it appears your report has been marked as Exhibit 290. You could do me a favor, and I opened it to page 17 for you. Uh, read all the way the portion that begins with autopsy and uh, ending at the portion just to yourself that begins with initial interview with Chris and Scott Hughes. Could you review that for me, please? Sure. You said beginning with autopsy? Yes, I believe that's at the very bottom of page 17. And the discussion of the autopsy goes to the middle of page 18. Okay. All right. And based on what we read there, it appears that you attended uh, the autopsy of Mr. Alexander on 6 12 of 2008. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. And, and just so we're clear as well, 
Um, I see on your report. Um, a State your question. It appears you authored your report on August 27th, 2008. Is that correct? Well, you still have an objection? No, All right, you may answer. Yes, August 27th. Okay. And just so we're clear, uh, is that the day you wrote it, or do you kind of, is that the date it's finalized? How does that work? That's the day it was, uh, this section of the report, or this portion of it, was entered into our report management system. Okay, so prior to writing a report, do you take notes, something of that nature? Yes, yeah. Okay, and then you get together at a certain point in time and put it together? Yes. And the final draft, so to speak, is what we're talking about of 8-27-2008? Yes, and it gives it that time stamp of okay. when it was finally entered. All right. Um, and in that report, you communicate, or you, it seems like you learned the fact that... Um, Improper impeachment. Please state your question. All right, and finished it. But um, it appears that you came away from that autopsy with the knowledge or with the belief that Mr. Alexander had been shot first. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you base that on your conversation with Ms. Dr. Horn, excuse me. Uh, with my observations through the observation window and also with a small conversation with the doctor. Okay. And then do you recall on August 7th of 2009 uh, giving some testimony in court related to this case? Yes, it's almost a year later. Yes. In a moment, Your Honor. And Your Honor, if I may approach witness. You may. Detective, this has been marked as Exhibit 260. I'm going to place it before you for now. I know you probably don't remember what you said exactly. Uh, as you pointed out, it was almost a year later to the uh, police report um, that you, you wrote. Uh, but you were under oath when you gave this testimony, right? Yes. Okay. Um, if you could be so kind, let's see here, as to turn to page 18 of that document. And I'll draw your attention to line 14. Yes. Uh, and you were asked there if you had spoken to Dr. Horn about this case. Hearsay. It's sworn testimony, Judge. Approach, please. Continue. You were asked if you, on that day, you were asked if you had spoken to Dr. Horn about this case. Is that correct? Objection improper impeachment. Overruled, you may answer that question. Yes. And you recall the answer you gave? I stated I did. Okay. And when did that conversation take place? Uh, a day prior to this hearing. Okay. So your conversation with Dr. Horn then would have took place on August 6, 2009? Yes. Okay. And you were in court for his testimony, correct? I don't recall if I was or not. Okay. Did you hear him testify to the idea that you, he didn't talk to you on August 6, 2009? Judge, in this case, uh, Dr. Horn's statement, he said he doesn't remember. Just All right, so your testimony was that you spoke to Dr. Horn one day before you gave this testimony. Are you talking about this testimony here? Yes, it, not testimony today, but testimony here. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And in that testimony, you were asked about the sequencing of injuries according to Dr. Horn, is that correct? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, and you were asked about, in terms of sequencing, which came first, which wound came first, correct? Yes. Okay. 
And do you recall what your answer was? I answered that the gunshot was possibly first. Okay. And what did you base your answer on? Well, I'd spoken to Dr. Horn the day before over the phone on a short conversation, knowing that I was having a hearing uh, on this matter. And I uh, discussed mainly uh, what kind of pain the victim would have gone through at that time, if um, the, the victim had suffered at that time, uh, those kinds of questions. Okay. And during that, we kind of discussed some other things, and one of them was uh, very briefly the sequencing. Uh, okay. You say very briefly, but this would, this would be important if you're giving sworn testimony in court, right? The sequencing was not that important in this, in this case at that time. So you felt it wasn't important to give accurate testimony in court in your prior proceedings? Is that what you're telling me? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying the most important portion was the uh, whether the victim, Travis Alexander, suffered in this well, let case. Let me ask you not what's the most important portion. Let's focus on what I asked. What I asked was whether or not it was important to give accurate testimony when you're testifying in a court. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And you did testify to the idea that the gunshot wound to the head was first, right? Yes. Okay. And you went on, you were asked also in that hearing, and you also talked about unconsciousness and that sort of thing. Uh, but you were also talked, you also talked about um, whether or not after incurring the shot to the head, Mr. Alexander could be conscious. Do you recall being asked that? Yes. Okay. And you relayed, did you, do you recall relaying the opinion that Mr. Alexander would be conscious after being, ex in the, uh, suffering the shot to the head? Yes, but that was my opinion at that time. That was your opinion, but what you were, so you weren't being, you weren't relaying Dr. Horn's opinion, as you said during those transcripts, you were relaying I, your I own? I would say that was my understanding of what the situation was, but I'm not the doctor, I'm not the ultimate decision maker on that. So your claim here today is that when you were at this important proceeding in this death penalty case, you were giving your opinion as to what you thought Dr. Horn might think as opposed to when you were testifying, you told the parties involved there that you'd spoken to him and this is what he believed. That was my understanding. You also gave opinions uh, about, uh, that supported um, this theory that uh, Mr. Alexander had been shot first, correct? Yes, I do recall that. Okay, I mean specifically you talked about uh, that he aspirated blood over the sink, correct? Yes, I do okay. remember that. And what does that mean? Aspirated blood means uh, blood being aspirated through the mouth and through the nose and onto an object such as the sink or the mirror in this case. Okay. So now you said oh, it was your, it was your uh, misunderstanding of Dr. Horn's testimony and that sort of thing. And, and you said you weren't sure if you were here in court, but in these court proceedings, is this the first you heard of a different story being told about when the wounds occurred? No. You've heard about it before? Yes, uh, during Dr. Horn's testimony. Okay. I thought you were talking about another testimony Dr. Horn gave, but I was here during his testimony the other day. Okay, so during this trial, Dr. Horn's testimony, you were here, right? Yes, I was. Okay, I want to be accurate this time. And you heard him testify then that he hadn't spoken with you the day before the hearing, correct? Objection. He said he didn't know. Sustained. 
you heard him also testify that says some of the things that we just talked about, about not losing consciousness, how that was something that he would never have said. You heard him say that? Yes. Okay. But that's what you testified to at the hearing? Yes. Okay. And so this change of story is something that you first heard about at trial. No, it's not the first time I've heard of it. Okay. When was the first time you heard this story changed? I don't remember. Uh, it might be several months ago or a year ago. What was the context? Uh, I don't recall exactly, but I know Dr. Horn had, had uh, gone and given an interview, I guess, with you and defense counsel, and something came out to me uh, informing me of, of what he stated during the interview. Okay. Did you make any attempts to correct the mistaken testimony you gave in 2009? No, because I told the truth and uh, spoke to what I believed at that time. I'm not about to change my testimony. But it was inaccurate. It was not inaccurate. It was mistaken. Mistaken. And that's, that's my mistake if I mistook his words or misunderstood him. But I am not a doctor, and I'm not about to give testimony on I'm not, a doctor. I'm not saying you're a doctor, detective. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, and we just talked about it, about the importance of giving accurate testimony. And in this hearing, you were asked specifically, if you talked to Dr. Horn, you said yes. You were asked if Dr. Horn had an opinion of the sequencing of the injuries. Right? Yes. Objection, that's the answer. Oh, they didn't ask you... What do you think, Detective Flores? What's your medical opinion? They didn't ask you that, did they? No. They asked you, what was Dr. Horn's opinion? And that's a pretty simple question, straightforward, right? Yes. OK. And so what you're telling us today is that you substituted your judgment for his? Is, is that what I'm hearing you say? No, if I gave that testimony, it was a misunderstanding of what Dr. Horn told me. Okay. So, it's inaccurate, is what you're saying today? Yes. Okay. And that's what I asked you a few moments ago. Did you take any steps to correct your inaccurate testimony? And you said, no, it wasn't inaccurate. It was, mis it was misunderstanding. Yes. I'm confused. Well, is it, is it inaccurate or is it misunderstanding? Which is it? Well, it's a misunderstanding okay. of what Dr. Horn told me. Okay. It's a pretty big one, isn't it? No, I don't believe so. You don't believe so. Okay. Judge, if we could have a take a break at this point in time. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the afternoon recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 10 minutes after 3. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermi, you may continue with cross-examination. <clears throat> Detective, this hearing on August 29th, um, who is representing the state at that hearing? 29th or August 7th? Is that the one you're talking about? August 7th. I'm sorry if I said another date. I apologize. August 7th, 2009. Who is representing the state? I believe it was Mr. Collins. Goes to motive and bias. Uh, overruled. Jimmy, answer. You may. Who was the prosecutor? Who represented the state at that hearing? It was Mr. Martinez. Okay. And earlier you testified that you said it was a, a misunderstanding or your mistake. Uh, your testimony that day was a mistake, right? No, my testimony wasn't a mistake. Uh, the portion of sequencing was a misunderstanding I had with Dr. Horn. Okay. Well, you were asked some pretty specific questions. You were asked if it was Dr. Horn's opinion that this rendered the victim unconscious or did he still remain conscious? That's a pretty specific question, right? Yes. And 
you answered, he said it would have rendered, possibly rendered the victim unconscious, but definitely could have been conscious, correct? Yes. Okay. And you also said, or you were asked, but in the circumstance based on all the other injuries, it was his opinion that it did not re render him unconscious, correct? Yes. Okay. And you say that you misunderstood that, you misunderstood Dr. Horn. That's your testimony here today, right? In the conversation I had with him prior to that hearing, I had spoken to him regarding uh, the anguish, the amount of pain, the suffering that, that Travis would have gone through that I'm day. I'm going to object. It's non-responsive and 403. Sustained. Can you repeat the question? I'm asking that you're claiming that what you said in that was a misunderstanding of Dr. Horn's, con your conversation with Dr. Horn. Yes. That's what it was. Okay. Yes. And, you know, we've seen uh, Ms. Arias uh, have interviews on television. You gave one as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. Okay. And do you recall who that was for? I believe it was CBS. Okay. And my recollection, you would probably know better than I, but that appeared to be a pretty lengthy interview. Is that correct? Um, uh, hour or so, maybe? Over an hour, yeah? Yes. Okay. And in that particular occasion, uh, you offered the same theory that Mr. Alexander had been shot first. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And you did that on a couple of different occasions. Is that right? Yes, that's what I believed. Okay. And so, but this was based on your misunderstanding, Dr. Horn. That's what you're telling us, right? Yes. Okay. And so you repeated this misunderstanding. You put this misunderstanding first in your police report, right? Yes. And second time, under oath of giving sworn testimony, you perpetrated the same misunderstanding. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then again, you did it uh, while being interviewed on national television. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I believed. Okay. Thank you, Detective. Redirect. Sir, with regard to the police report, uh, that was shown here in terms of the sequencing of the shots, take a look at it again and see whether or not anywhere in Exhibit 290, starting with DA00018, and then going to the previous page, which is 17, whether or not you ever indicate a sequencing of injuries, ever. No. It doesn't indicate that, does it? No, it does not. In fact, with regard to that, do you talk about the wound that the victim received? Yes or no? Yes, I do. Do you talk about the lacerations and the puncture wounds and the length that they might be? Yes. Do you talk about whether or not there was stippling to those wounds? Yes. Do you talk about a report uh, as to which injuries may have been fatal or not? Yes. Do you also talk about the knife wounds in the back and how far they went in? Yes, I did. Do you talk about whether or not those were fatal? Yes. Do you talk about whether or not the victim had any defensive wounds to him? Yes. Do you talk about whether or not he attempted to protect himself during the attack? I did. Do you talk about whether the fatal wounds consisted of stab wounds to the center of the chest? Did you talk about that? Yes. Did you talk about um, what damage that wound caused? Yes, I did. And did you talk about whether or not the wound to the throat was fatal? Yes. And then you also talked about the manner of death, whatever that may have been, right? Correct. Anywhere there, do you talk about any sequencing at all? There's no sequencing in there at all. And this was written when? Why don't you tell me again when this was written? It was written in August of that year. 2008? Yes. Why don't you just take a look at it and see what date it was actually written? It was written and submitted on August 27th of 2008 at 4.29 p.m. 
And nowhere do you indicate any sequencing, do you? No. Do you ever indicate anywhere here that Dr. Horn said or gave you a sequencing of events? No. Or injuries, I'm sorry. Do you? No. With regard to Exhibit 260, that was a hearing in which you testified at, correct? Yes, it was. It was under oath, wasn't it? Yes. Prior to that hearing, did you speak to Dr. Horn? Yes, the day prior. With regard to speaking to Dr. Horn, did you speak to him about any potential suffering by the victim? That was the main focus. Overruled to that question. With regard to that particular conversation that you had. And the defense attorney, was it somebody else at that time? Yes. And yes, more, yes it was. And there was more than one, wasn't there? Yes. And with regard to that, you were asked about Dr. Horn. He did, and the question was, he did indicate that he was not certain as to which came first, correct? Correct. And you were asked as to which injuries the belief was came first. Do you remember being asked that? Yes. And do you remember then that the defense attorneys objected because you didn't know what you were talking about? Do you remember that? Objection relevant. Ruled. Do you remember them objecting to foundation because you didn't know what you were talking about? Yes, I do remember that. Are you a medical doctor? No, I'm not. But you were allowed to testify anyway, right? Yes. Because of the type of hearing that it was, wasn't it? Yes. And was it your understanding, just your understanding, that whether or not hearsay was allowed at that hearing? Question was his understanding? His understanding. Overruled. Yes. And could you tell us what you thought Dr. Horn had said? I thought Dr. Horn. Yeah, but you, you could tell us what you thought Dr. Horn said, right? Yes. And you told us what you thought he said, right? I did. Were you correct? No, I was not. And with regard to the opinion that you gave, prior to giving that opinion, did you, you know who Lisa Perry is, don't you? Yes. Who is she? Uh, she works for the Mace Police Department lab. And Lisa Perry, did you talk to her before rendering that opinion back in August of, uh, what was it, 2009? Yes. Did you talk to her? Uh, I talked to her on many occasions, yes. But did you talk to her in anticipation of that hearing? Yes. And did you, did she give you any opinions that you incorporated, yes or no? Um, yes, a few. And still you went ahead with what you thought was your opinion, right? Yes. And your opinion was based on conversations with Dr. Horn. That, those conversations with Dr. Horn, were they recorded? No, they were not. And were they in person or telephonic? Telephonic. And the, and the majority of the time, what, were, what was the subject area that you were spent talking about? The suffering of the victim. Did he ever write anything to you, giving you the sequence of events? No, he never did. Did you ever see anything written by him indicating anything of the sequencing of events? No. So the bottom line, that information that you gave, whose opinion was it? Was it yours or Dr. Horn's? It was my opinion. I don't have an opinion. You may. Are there any questions from the jury for this witness? You may step down. The state may call its next witness. Can you spell your first and last name? Jody, J O D I, Leg, L E G G. Do you do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide? I do. Thank you. Please walk around and have a seat. Jody Legg. And who do you work for? I work for the City of Mesa Crime Lab. What do you do there at the uh, Crime Lab? I'm a Forensic Scientist 3. I work in the Biology Department. And um, what do you do there in the Biology Department? I specifically analyze um, evidence for the presence of DNA, hopes to get a, a DNA profile. One of the things that uh, we learned earlier today is that um, there's a screener that's involved. Are, you know what a screener is, correct? Yes. 
What is a screener? Well, are you the same thing as a screener? Um, when we say screener, the, another term for that is serologist. Right. And the screener or the serologist is the person that actually um, looks at the evidence up front and decides what areas to swab or to cut in order to send through to DNA. And so prior to moving on to DNA, you would be trained, all people would be trained as a serologist. And so yes, I am a screener and a DNA analyst. How does your job differ from that of a screener? My job as a DNA analyst, I accept the evidence from the screener and then perform DNA analysis on the, that particular item. I don't necessarily look at each item and decide what area to cut or swap. What, um, what, uh, what is your educational background, for example, your college background, and then we'll talk a little bit about your training. I have a Bachelor of Science degree from SLU in Louisiana. I have numerous classes in chemistry and biology, postgraduate level, and um, in-house training and external training. How long have you been in the position that you're in where you actually conduct DNA testing? I have been with the city of Mesa since 2004. Prior to that, I have 15 years of experience as a um, research chemist, not in a forensics field. And uh, with regard to DNA, um, I think we sort of know what that is, but what is DNA? What, first of all, what does it stand for? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, it's actually the genetic information that is held inside our, our cells, in the nuclei of the cells. It comes from our mother and father. It's inherited. And, well, my question is this. Everyone has this DNA. Correct? Everyone has DNA. And uh, just by way of illustration only, doesn't everybody have, for example, one hand, two arms, two legs, that sort of thing, two eyes and a nose and a mouth, right? Correct. For the most part, all of us are um, very much alike. There's only a very small portion of our DNA that is completely unique to us. So I guess what I'm asking is, the type of work that you do, what is it that you do that allows you to, for example, differentiate the biological substance from somebody from that of somebody else if most of the DNA is the same? Um, the specific locations that we look at in forensic DNA analysis are locations that would be specific to an individual. So those are the ones that, if you look at, they're the ones that differentiate that indiv individuals amongst ourselves? Is that how it works? Those are the very low percentage of um, locations that are differentiated. And if you want to, once you do this process, um, what does the result look like? Is it a graph that goes up and down? Is it numbers? Is it in writing? Exactly what is it that is the end result of, uh, of uh, the examination? You will have a graphic representation and numbers. So you'll have peaks with numbers underneath. With regard to the peaks and the numbers underneath, are you the one that actually um, interprets the peaks or is that just automatically done by a machine? The instrumentation will provide the, the graphs for you, then the analyst looks at it and compares it to known graphs and numbers to, to decide if there's a match or not. And what area of, we're looking at chromosomes, right? Correct. Certain areas. How many areas of the chromosome do we look at? Um, 16 different locations. All right. Do you also look at the sex marker, as they call it? Yes, it's called amylogenin. Is that included in the 16 or is that 16 plus one? It's included in. So you look at the sex marker and then you look at 16 locations, is that right? The sex marker plus 15 others. Right. I see. And if you look at location one, whatever that may be, and you get a, the results, are the results numerical? Um, can they be numerical? They can be numerical. So is, when there's a, pro, do you know what a profile is? Yes, a profile would be the compilation of the, the numbers attributed to the peaks. And so you look at, for example, the 15, do uh, you know what the word loci is? Mm -hmm. What is that? Locations on the chromosome. And so you look at these locations, and then you get one number, or what is it that you get? You can get one or two numbers if it's a single individual. Each of us, um, like I said, we get the... Um, DNA from our parents, one from our mother and one from our father. So if your mother and father have the same, you may have one peak, but otherwise you can have two peaks. So a single profile, you'll have no more than two. A mixture of more than, per you would have three or more. 
Let's say that the contribution from the mother is a 12. Let's just pick that number. Okay. And the contribution from the father is a 12. You still report both locations, though, right? Correct, but you'd only see a single peak. Right, and it's still the same number, but it's still you do report the two locations. Though. That's correct. So that if you get a full profile at each location, each location has two readings, correct? Two numbers. Two numbers associated with it. One associated with mom and one associated with the dad, right? Correct. And this profile or these numbers are then compared to the other profiles to see if there's a match, right? That's correct. And so what we're talking about is a matching of numbers. Exactly. And if, for example, at one of the areas, one of the loci, there is not a match, let's say that instead of a 12 and 12, and everything else matches, you have a 12 and 13, is that a match, sort of a match, or not, or, or not at all? Um, it depends on if there's any other information available in the graphical representation. How about if you get two of them that are not the same? 12 and 12 of one, and the person that you're looking at is a 12 and a 13, and the other place is a 13 and 13, and the result is a 13 and a 14. Do you know what an exclusion is? If, if, if there is no other numbers or peaks present, and a known sample is, say, a 12, 13, and then your graphical representation in the numbers was, say, a 13, 14, then it would be a no match. The person would be excluded. In, in real life, I mean, obviously, we don't get um, a situation where you could always get one pristine sample of the unknown and then uh, because people are always touching things and that sort of thing. Uh, what's that called? What, what happens if more than one person touches it, say, two people? You would end up with what's known as a mixture of DNA. Even though it's a mixture, are you then able to still tell whether or not it's a match to one person, two people? Can you still do that? Yes, you can. In this case, how many known samples were submitted to you for comparison? The names, if you will. Do you have I had that? two samples submitted. Um, well, no, not samples, but known. In other words, do you know what a buckle swab is? Two buckle swabs were so, submitted. So only two buckle swabs of known people were submitted? Correct. Nobody. Okay. Who were they of? One was of Jody Arias, and one was of Travis Alexander. And with regard to Jody Arias, did you develop this profile? Yes. And with regard to Mr. Alexander, did you develop this profile? Yes. Did you look at the profiles between the two of them to see if they matched each other? They did not match each other. So, so far, so good, right? Yes. And in terms of the crime scene, did you receive a item that was purportedly near a wall, item 77 is what it was, um, for you to take a look at and submit it and check to see whether or not there was any DNA and whether or not you could develop a profile. I received a swab from the wall. All right. And were you able to develop a profile? Was there, first of all, was there any biological substance in there? There was biological substance in that a profile was developed. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part of my hair. A profile was developed. Okay, and that profile, tell me about that profile. It was a mixture of DNA. And this mixture of DNA, the, the, this mixture profile, were you then able to compare it, for example, to Travis Alexander's profile? Yes. And when you did that, what, was, what were the results? The, the mixture turned out to be um, the major contributor to the, the... Let me stop you there. What do you mean when you say major contributor? When you have a mixture of DNA, we were talking about earlier that you can have a graphical representation with peaks. You can look at it and see which peaks are larger. You, you're able to determine who gave more DNA to the profile than another. So a major profile can be um, picked out. Right. That major profile um, matched Jody Arias. Okay. The remaining, what we would call a minor profile, the lesser contributor, matched Travis Alexander. All right. So what does it mean that a person's a major contributor in terms of the quantity, I guess, of DNA, since we're talking major and minor? The quantity are, you would assume that the quantity was higher because the peaks are larger for that contribution. But was there a result at every one of the low side for Travis Alexander? Was there no. A, so what does that mean that there wasn't a result at all of the low side? It just means that there was not enough DNA present to develop a full profile. 
was there um, a full profile, enough DNA from Jody Arias to have a full, if you will, profile? No. And so there was not a full, pro full profile for him, not a full profile for her, correct? That's correct. But even though that's there, was there were there any exclusions? In other words, could Jody Arias be excluded? No. Could Mr. Alexander be excluded? No. So what is your opinion, I guess? That's My opinion is that both of them were present in the profile. And the biological substance that was submitted, was it blood or do you know? I don't know. You just know that it's some it's biological, biological material. Right. How about with regard to the uh, hair? Uh, was, did you have anything to do with the root of a hair? There was um, two pieces of hair that were submitted. Okay. One of the pieces contained a root. Uh -huh. And the second piece was further up on the hair. So a hair, I, I believe it was a um, length of hair that was cut with one portion containing a root, and then the next portion was that piece right adjacent to it. With regard to the, this hair, um, do you know whether or not it was item number six from the scene? I don't know. We have property ID numbers that I deal with in the lab that are different than the item numbers at the scene. Do, do you have any description on your report that indicates what number they may have been at at the scene? It would have been a, a 39 something. Can I refer to my sure, report? Sure, please I can give go you ahead. Alexander is under request. Would you want to share this? If I can have Do you need it? Do you want just that one? I'm so sorry. It would be item number 392692-A. But you don't know what item number it was out at the scene then? I do not, I'm sorry. Okay. But you did do a hair, right? Yes. And in terms of the actual hair part, not the root, were you able to get a result? Not the root? Not the root. Okay, the, the hair was cut into two sections. So the part that did not contain the root, there was a profile developed that matched Travis Alexander. The portion of the hair that did contain the root um, matched to Jody Arias. So explain to me what we have here in terms of the part of the hair that matched Mr. Alexander. What are we talking about there? There was um, biological material on top of the hair. With a hair and DNA analysis, um, you need a root material to do what's known as nuclear DNA. Our DNA is housed in the nucleus of the cells. And so for hair, if, if I pull my hair out and the root is present on the end of it, I can get a DNA profile from that root material, from that, that end only. If I go further up into the hair, you know, and just take, you know, a broken off piece that's just the shaft of the hair, there is no nuclei in that section. And so the two different sections are cut to say, okay, the root comes from this particular um, donor of a profile. And the next area of it, I can tell what is this, who does the substrate on, or the substance on top of the hair belong to. So the substance on top of this hair that you examine, the profile matched who? Travis Alexander. How about the root? Who did that match? The root matched Jody Arias. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. We have no questions from this witness. Any questions from the jury for this witness? I see no hands. You may step down. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the recess for the weekend. We will see you on Monday, 1030 a.m. Please arrive by 1025. Remember the admonition. Are there any questions? Have a nice weekend. You are excused.